Hey everyone, I'm Caitlin Barnard. And I'm Victor Gamow. In this series, we chat with software developers and technology leaders to tackle your biggest API connectivity challenges. Stay tuned to this episode for tools, tactics, strategies that will help you to take your distributed architectures to the next level. Let's begin. Today, I'd like to welcome Aaron Weichel, CEO at MS3. Aaron is here to talk to us about how to support your legacy applications while embarking on digital transformation efforts. If you're currently trying to figure out how to modernize your applications while dealing with technical debt, this episode's for you. Aaron, could you start us off by kind of setting the stage for our viewers on the problems organizations run into and how this relates to common connectivity challenges? Yeah, thanks, Caitlin. You know, first, I want to say I'm super excited to be part of, you know, Comcast and, you know, a tremendous opportunity to present some of the exciting things that we have going on here. So one of the things, you know, our organization has been in the integration space for over a decade. And so we've seen the evolution of technology as it goes from, you know, legacy based type of B2B interconnectivity with, you know, pipe delimited data, fixed field sets through SOAP integrations, and now we're into our next generation of RESTful APIs and gRPC. Organizations, however, don't move quite as fast as what technology does. And so there's a lot of technical debt that is, you know, strung along for decades, um, you know, across multiple industries that need to be supported as you're going through this digital transformation. And so this problem is something that Organizations want the latest and greatest, but they still need to support the legacy-based uh, protocols and interconnectivity. So we've actually, uh, you know, came with some solutions in order to help address those needs. So one of the things we've we've talked a little bit about is how organizations in the early 2000s adopted these SOAP-based protocols, and they're now having to figure out what to do with those services. How are you seeing organizations handling this? So organizations have done a, a variety of different things, right? They've implemented, you know, technology tooling like ESBs and in, in order to provide both message and protocol based abstractions. They've implemented a variety of different technologies uh, in order to implement a way to hide the soap behind the scenes. Uh, and if you look at uh, a, a gentleman by the name of Martin Fowler, uh, he actually has a uh, document written out there around the strangular pattern or, or strangular facade. And so we like to take that pattern and implement it in what we call the mullet pattern, right? Where you have a nice clean API in the front, you got the messy soap in the back. And what that does is it provides a layer of abstraction between the consumers and the legacy systems. Because you have that abstraction point, it allows a period of disconnection between the services so that way, as you begin to modernize the backend uh, systems, those are unimpactful for your consumers, which is really important because no one wants to have a change that goes into place. And then every time that a system continues to modernize or makes incremental changes on the backend system that all of the consumers have to uh, uh, make modifications. That is a very costly approach. And by taking this mullet pattern, it really helps to alleviate that type of uh, cost uh, initiatives that organizations face on the daily. So one of the ways that you've addressed this, I believe, is through leveraging some custom plugins in Kong Gateway. Can you walk us through that approach? Absolutely. <clears throat> so as, as we know, you know, Kong uh, Gateway is really pushing the boundary of the next generation capabilities, right? It's supporting RESTful-based protocols. It's doing gRPC and protobuffing. It has the, you know, GraphQL. And you intertwine that with service mesh uh, for really a connected platform and not so much an API gateway. And, you know, sadly, organizations, when they look at Kong uh, at this point in time, they just they think it's just an API gateway and they don't understand that is that next step to interconnectivity. And it's much more than just that. And so what we're doing is we're providing a way that organizations can leverage Kong as a product for their next generation uh, mo uh, modernizations, but also giving that same platform the ability to support legacy-based communications. And so because of the focus being on the, moder <clears throat> the modernization uh, aspects of Kong, SOAP really is a second-hand citizen, 
uh, because you, let's let's not so you know I, I understand the business aspect of let's not worry about what was let's focus on what is coming and great business uh, decision and business step. So our soap plugins that we've built addresses a gap that was there to allow organizations to be able to go from soap based interconnectivity, which there is a lot of that out there, into modern technologies. And so we've built a series of plugins that support everything from uh, exposing SOAP services and having that abstracted through the gateway and being able to consume and have your automation tooling be able to ingest a WSDL and generate those stubs from a consumer uh, perspective. We've provided capabilities for data validation and SOAP action validation. And that's really key because the best way way to address uh, system performance is to identify problem calls at the source or or at as early as possible. So if we have the ability to do data validation, SOAP action validation at the, at the gateway level, then that's alleviating processing time that may be a very busy backend system that doesn't have the same capabilities of modern technology uh, we'll, won't have to worry about. Um, in addition, one of the big problems that we see uh, is the poor implementation of fault handling within SOAP. So SOAP is something that whenever you have a problem, it doesn't really give you a nice clean status code associated with um, you know, what the problem was. Like when you have a, uh, a 401 or a 403 or 404 types of uh, errors in RESTful um, APIs, that is pretty self-telling just in the status code, but everything that comes back from SOAP is just a 500, right? And so inside of that, they have what's called a SOAP fault body. Now, historically with SOAP faults, they dump a lot of information in there. There could be stack traces, there could be sensitive information, a lot of really ugly things that you don't want to go out to your end consumers. If you're in the health industry or uh, financial industry, there could be sensitive information that's coming back across the wire that you really don't want and you don't have the ability to control that. So one of the components that we've actually built is a soap fault abstractor. So what happens is, is when the soap fault comes back, we clean it up. We say, contact your administrator and take that, that heavy lift of being able to process that off of the systems and having to you know, make sure that everything is coming back clean. Because at, at the end of the day, we don't want our developers or, or the, our clients' developers working on building enhancements to SOAP services, which should be, you know, slowly going away, but focusing on writing new RESTful or gRPC-based services that can go through the gateway. So by providing that, whatever technical debt that they uh, historically have had, now we can clean it up with, with some of these plugins. Uh, the next one is the Mullet Pattern plugin. And so this is what I was talking to you earlier about where we can actually begin to expose the RESTful-based APIs and the gRPC-based protocols through the front-end gateway. This ability will give us uh, or will give our clients the ability to expose legacy SOAP services without having to rewrite them right now. So they can... Uh, expose that through Kong with a contract, uh, whether with open API or, you know, through a protobuf doc, um, and your consumers can start consuming that. The plugin will do mapping from those standard HTTP protocols or from the objects within the gRPC into the SOAP actions. As you know, with SOAP, SOAP has SOAP actions that says, what is it that we're going to do with this inbound request, right? And so it could be processing data, it could be retrieving data, it could be updating data, but it all comes through the same HTTP uh, request, which is an HTTP post. So what we do is we actually provide the capability to map a GET operation on the front end to a HTTP post with a, let's say, GET customer, uh, uh, SOAP action on the backside. Uh, likewise, if we're doing a post operation for the customer, we do a post operation to create customer on, on the SOAP action. So, so this gives us the ability to really uh, blend the front end RESTful capability to the uh, SOAP back end. And that's going to alleviate rewrite of consumers uh, down, the, down the line. 
especially as you're going from, let's say you have an old ERP system, uh, maybe it's you know an SAP system or it's a Microsoft Dynamics and you're moving to a Salesforce, right? Those legacy systems are using SOAP. As you're migrating your ERP components into, into Salesforce, now your consumers are completely oblivious that any of this work is going on on the backside because they're still getting the data models. They're still using the operations the way that they did before. So that's really, really powerful. Next thing that we did was we actually created an additional plugin kit for uh, Kong. Uh, So what we did was we took uh, a uh, Java-based component and we built it to utilize the uh, communication bridge within Kong. And the reason that we decided to go with this direction is because a lot of the powerful data transformation tooling is written in Scala or, or Java or things that are using a JVM. And so one of the open source uh, platforms that we really love is called Data Sonnet. So Data Sonnet is a template-based transformation uh, language that is written in Scala. It was originally created by Google. Uh, uh, Shortly thereafter, it was adopted by Databricks. And then we went through and we added in a bunch of capability and functionality to enable some really complex data transformation. This is really important, especially if you're wanting to do things like orchestration, some lightweight orchestration in the gateway, where maybe from a mobile application perspective, you don't want them to have to send in these huge requests and these huge responses back and iterate through the data to then make the next set of requests. Uh, That becomes very important. Uh, erroneous to the mobile applications where their CPUs and their memory just can't handle that uh, that amount of work. So this capability allows Kong to have uh, a lightweight call come in from a mobile application. It can use data sauna to call, let's say, a product catalog. And then that product catalog would then return back information that we can then use another call out to a system to provide additional information, start to shrink the data model to only what the mobile application wants, and then return it back. That pulls the workload off the mobile application and provides that into backend systems, which have substantially more resources. And so that's another really powerful way that you can uh, you know, master uh, Kong with these plugins to su- to you know, support a legacy on the back end, but mobile thing or modern and mobile things on the front end. Yeah, that was a fantastic overview. Thank you so <laughs> much for taking the time to do that. Um, I know you have a demo prepared though today, so I'm super excited um, to actually see how this is done. So, want to dive into that? What we've done is we've implemented a, a series of WSDL based uh, components. Uh, for example, we have our a custom WSDL DAO, which is the application plugin that will allow us to ingest WSDLs and be able to provide that into uh, the Kong DB. In this example here, what we're going to do is we're going to be utilizing a commercial based temperature converter and we're going to pull that WSDL into Kong so that way that we can share this to all the Kong endpoints. And so what we'll do is we'll actually go into and utilize the Kong admin gateway. Uh, in order to load this information in. So as you can see here, we're able to pull up the WSDL based off of the Kong endpoint. As you can see here with the gateway WSDL, we're um, consuming a uh, Fahrenheit to Celsius SOAP-based service. And what happens here is that we actually ingest the WSDL and we store this information inside of the Kong DB. So one thing to be cognizant of here is that when you're working with SOAP and we need to be able to store this, it will not work in the DB less mode. In addition, we also pull the schemas, right? So we pull the schemas in so that way that those can be obfuscated at the gateway level. One problem that you run into is that there will be a firewall between the two and you're unable to be uh, consumed the schemas from the wisdom. So here we have the converter wisdom uh, from W3 schools. And this is the source of what we're going to be doing. So we'll take this wisdom here. And what we're going to do is we're going to use the admin API that we have a plugin written. And we're going to post that into the Kong API gateway. The reason that we want to do this is because we want to make sure that we're supporting the DevOps CICD pipeline as you have new wisdoms that are coming to the gateway. The whistles are generally already uh, provided. And so as you can see here, we'll put the 
the URL in, and it will import that information. When it responds back, it's going to give us a location following API best practices, and that location is a unique key that we'll need to hold on to. The reason being that we need that key is because that tells the Kong gateway and the plugins exactly where all this information should be stored and should be held. As you can see here, whenever we put that key in for the location, you're able to call it to make sure that the actual the whistle was actually pulled in. It is pulled in as a string. That's why you see new lines. So that way that it can be easily handled whenever we need to serve it up to back end consumers. So the second piece that we do is now we have the WSDL provider. So the first one was the DAO. That is the way to be able to pull the information from destination systems, whether it's from a file or whether it's from a service or you want to manually upload it, that gets it into Kong. Now we can actually then use the plugin provider to then expose that externally to the, the end consumers. And we can update these paths however we want to. We're just using temp here. As you can see, these plugins will be available inside of the Kong UI. We've put it in so that way that we can have everything associated with an easy configuration capability. This alleviates some of the headache of, of needing to know how to use an API to modify or update configurations within a custom plugin. So we went ahead and spent the extra time to put this capability in here. As you can see here, um, we specify where we want the endpoint for the, the URL. And you can also specify WSDL as being the query parameter whenever you want to return the actual WSDL itself. Uh, some organizations may have location equals WSDL, um, but typically the WSDL, uh, question mark WSDL, is how you tell a organization uh, that's consuming your service where the WSDL definition we have some masking capabilities, which we'll, we'll return to that in just a minute, but you can also specify your response headers. So it's always good to define this, especially if you want to come back as a application XML or text XML. In this case, we want this to come back as being text XML, so that way it's uh, you know very simple to consume. Lastly, remember the UID on the response, that goes in and that provides our actual service that's accessible from the, uh, the endpoints. So whenever we go to the endpoint, now it's able to render, we can use the service and be able to call this SOAP application. So one of the other pieces that uh, we talked about just as, or I was talking about just a second ago is the configuration abstraction. So as you can see here, it comes with services URLs. But as I mentioned before, you may be behind a firewall where these service endpoints from the SOAP action are not accessible. So with that being said, we support both just having the gateway provide the service definition with the service natively in there or where everything has to come through the gateway. So in this case, what we're doing is we're going to go through. Uh, you can mask the addresses to your backend service. So what happens is this address will be found inside the whistle and it will be replaced with the gateway URL that we'll provide. When it comes in, it defines the route so that way that when it comes to that gateway endpoint, it knows where to go within your backend destination system. This helps to alleviate those uh, scenarios where the gateway might expose a whistle, but it's a proxy, right? And so it's telling you about a service that you can't even reach because it's hidden within the backend. So as you can see here, we're going to go ahead and convert these different URLs. One of the things that you'll need to do is, is because there are services defined within this, you'll need to go through and select which URLs that you want to mask. Uh, so in this case, we're going to go ahead and mask each one of those services so that way that uh, all of them are functional through the gateway instead of any of them going trying to go directly to a service that may not be there. We'll go ahead and finish this up. And so once you have your URLs in there, now you can turn on your masking. And what it will do is it will, will mask that uh, service endpoint so that way it will come through the gateway and know exactly where it needs to go. So we update. So one thing I did here is we have data validation. So as you can see here, it's missing a URL. So we'll scroll up and you see on the very first one, you have a missing port slash. So data validation is built into the UI as well to make sure that you don't make mistakes. So now if we go in and we reload this, we'll see 
that URL has now changed to the localhost 10, the URL of the gateway. So this is really important and key to ensure that the calls are coming through the gateway uh, to your backend services. Uh, you can apply this to all of your schemas as well and your data DAOs, and everything will work as you anticipate and design. So we're going to go ahead and make a quick call, and you'll see here that the service is running through the gateway, and everything will be working. So moving on to the, the custom SOAP validation plugin. So this is the one that I was telling you about earlier where we can actually validate both the body of the SOAP and we can also hide the faults. So like the Whistle provider, this one also provides the capability for us to hide the, the abstraction of the SOAP faults. Now these can all run in tandem. Uh, here we just deleted it, um, the other one, uh, but you can run them all uh, together. And so as you can see here, we have the ability to configure to hide faults and also to configure the body. So just like we did before, we have the ability to configure this based off the UUID uh, that was provided by the original service. Here we'll pull in this UUID so it knows what it's going to validate against. And the information that we actually had uh, originally um, within the SOAP service is what it's going to utilize. So if you remember, whenever we ingested the WSDL, it had the information associated with the schema. That schema data is what is going to go through and make sure that everything is validated and it does not break. As you can see here, you know we're, we're running through and doing the conversion. And then if we go through and we make some changes here, it will actually uh, ensure that the SOAP fault does not work. So we're gonna change this Celsius here. So we run this through. So here is the unable to validate the body. So as you can see here, the plugin now is doing the validation of the SOAP body uh, and terminating that call and responding back to the caller at the gateway level. We also have the capability, as I mentioned, to do data transformation. The plugin that we showed there at the end uh, did the data validation, but then it also hid the SOAP fault that came back so that way that it was easy for your consumer to know that there was a problem and they, they need to communicate with the admin. Thanks, Aaron, for walking us through that. Awesome. So I know we have some more. We'll share some more information um, in the description of this video on how viewers can learn more about Datasonnet as well as MS3 and all the great work you're doing, um, including those plugins. But any other final words for the audience before we wrap up? You know, the last words is that technology moves a lot faster than organizations. And uh, MS3 is here to try and ensure that organizations are successful in getting from where they are today and leapfrogging their competitors. And you do this by having smart strategic patterns and approaches in order to do that. And so that's why we understand this space and we understand that organizations can't just forklift from one technology to another and be able to be successful. So these types of plugins and this type of ingenuity is what MS3 brings to the table in order to help organizations accelerate their modernization without impacting in an entire plethora of different ways, um, whether it be your SOAP-based organization or if you're fixed format uh, or if you're, you know, B2B type of communications, those types of scenarios aren't going away anytime soon, but they, they can easily be updated in order to, you know, allow for modern communication to occur between your consumers and your backend systems. Awesome. Some fantastic words of wisdom um, to end on today. So thank you so much, Aaron, for joining me today. Um, thank you to our audience who tuned in and we'll see you next time. Thanks to everyone out there for watching. I hope you enjoyed today's episode as much as we enjoyed recording it. Make sure to hit that like button now. And be sure to subscribe so you don't miss a new episode. Don't forget to drop us a comment if you have any questions for today's guests or if there's a topic you'd like to see us cover in the future. And we will see you on the next episode of Concast.